Scrooge awoke in his own bedroom. There was no doubt about that. But it, and his own adjoining sitting room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green, and it looked a perfect grove. The leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light, as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney, as that petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor, to form a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, brawn, joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young. My elder brothers born in these later years pursued the phantom? I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if ye have aught to teach me, let me profit by me. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room, its contents, all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and made a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar. Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and knowing it for their own, and basking in the luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced around the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire, until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever gotten to your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit, "'and your brother, Tiny Tim. "'And Martha wasn't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. 
We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his treadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declination of his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church, and had come, come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house, that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she still had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped that the people saw him in church, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that tiny, tiny Tim was growing strong and hardy. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe that there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family indeed. As Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it at all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take up the pudding and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. 
Suppose somebody should have got over the wall in the backyard and stolen it while they were married with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hallow, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed and smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since his, their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovelful of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth, in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Scrooge raised his head speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, she said, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows that better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink to the health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were, t they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the Balefill being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which could bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she worked at a stretch, 
and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded, and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, as the scene vanished, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, and while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, laughed out lustily. He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, and no doubt it was. All kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Although she was what you would have called provoking, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Who suffers by all his whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us and won't come to dine with us. What's the consequence? He didn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I am very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast, who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were about. When they sung a glee or catch, <clears throat> I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one, and never swell the large veins of his forehead, or get red in the face over it. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it was good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. There was first a game at Blind Man's Bluff, though. 
and I no more believe Topper was really blinded than I believe he had eyes in his boots. Because the way in which he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage to the, to the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the choir irons, tumbling over chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there he went. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answering to their questions, yes and no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed el elicited from him, he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every new question put to him, his nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge. Which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected to the reply to, Is it a bear? ought to have been yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that, we, that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in a breath of, la of the last words spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds and they were cheerful on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich. In almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man, in his little brief authority, had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the book for the ghost and saw it no more. Of a 
white Christmas Just like the ones I used to know Where the treetops glisten And children listen To hear sleigh bells in the snow Remembering the prediction of old Jacob Marley and lifting up his eyes, Scrooge beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I'm in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and to do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me. I know, lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were, in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin, I don't know much about it, either way, I only know he's dead. When did he die, inquired another, last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? Asked a red-faced gentleman. I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin. Company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. Bye-bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach a point importance a conversation apparently so trivial, but feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost province was the future. He looked about in that very place for his own image but another man stood in his accustomed corner. And though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself amongst the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life. And he thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. 
they left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were brought by a grey-haired rascal of great age who sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop, but she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone to be the first, cried she, who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it, you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to sell? What have you got to sell? Half a minute's patience, Joe, and you shall see. What odds then, what odds? Mrs. Dilber said the woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. Mrs. Dilber, whose manner was remarkable for general agreement, said, no, indeed, ma'am. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he did have someone to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been, you may depend upon it. I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What would you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains. Don't drop that oil on the bed blankets now. His blankets? Whose else do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. Oh, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it, if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The scene had changed and now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon his, this bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, and the body of this plundered man unknown. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death, or this dark chamber, spirit, will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him to Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughter were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child 
and set him in the midst of them. Third Scrooge heard those words. He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color, oh, poor Tiny Tim. They're, they're better now. It makes them weak by candlelight. And I shouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these past few evenings, Mother. I have known him walk with, I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often, and so have I, exclaimed another, so had all. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so, and it was no trouble, no trouble. And there's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who would help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got on his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face. And if they said, don't mind it, father, don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, my little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been further apart perhaps than they were. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was with the covered face whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I drew nearer to that stone to which you point, Answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was unmoved as ever. Scrooge crept toward it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer. Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No spirit, oh no, no spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope 
Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand followed. I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall arrive within me. I will not shout out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me, I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends him. He was checked into his transports by the church's ringing, out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night, clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether you've sold, they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. It is. Go and buy it. Walker, explained the boy. No, no, I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here that I may give the direction where to take it. Come back with a man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. Shan't know who sends it. It's the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them short off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the street. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant. In a word, the three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, and Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Y yes, sir. Where is he, my love? 
He's in the dining room, sir, along with the mistress. He knows me, says Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred? But bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It was a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be hard here. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party. Wonderful games. Wonderful unanimity. Wonderful happiness. But he was up early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No, Bob. A quarter past. No, Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it. What do you mean coming in here at this time of day? Uh, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step, step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in his waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again, and therefore, I'm going to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken, as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye. Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town or borough, in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Christmas comes but once a year, and here's our wish for you. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart
you go slow down? Why are you in a hurry? What's the rush? Relax, there's no need to worry. Ain't no need, got no use for second guessing. No use fussing, you got no sad need expressing. Stop suppressing, it's calling me. That is true. The melody's gonna get to you. But if I do the doop doop like a lump. But if I do the doop doop make me jump. But if I do the doop doop see me now. But if I get more than the law allows. Hey, feeling better. So, oh, so much better. I'm light as a feather. My blues are gone forever. Sing, 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 sing. All you gotta do is sing. Girls and boys make a noise. Just try singing with a swing. Just sing with a swing. A swing, a swing is a thing. Come on, let's sing and swing. Yeah. One. Two, one, two, three, four. Sing, sing, sing. All you gotta do is sing. Girls and boys make a noise. Just try singing with a swing. All you gotta do is sing. Sing. Oh shoot, I blew it already. I didn't start. Use for second guess.